Chapter 3, The Girl Can See 102 Days to Go About 48 hours ago, Pollock was at home, getting ready for her day shift at work. It was a beautiful day, the morning light, fresh and dappling, stole through the leaves and fell on the wonderful, pastel curtains of the apartment. It was cool and crisp inside, the whole ambience injecting a new energy for a great beginning. A melodious song was wafting from the radio somewhere in the flat. Along with the soft voice of the singer, another voice was singing along, equally sweet albeit less famous. It emanated from the only inhabitant of the apartment, a comely girl in her later twenties. Her voice echoed from the bathroom through the vents, hitching a ride with the steam that wafted through, as well. She indulged in a hot, luxurious, and thoroughly enjoyable bath. Minutes later, she stepped out wearing a bathrobe. Pollock was her name, a Hindi word for eyelid. Indeed, her eyes were very pretty, almond-shaped and dark brown like a sweet chocolate that carried a complex, bitter aftertaste. Her parents named her Pollock after holding their doe-eyed baby for the first time, who expressively blinked at them in reverie. Her beauty extended beyond her eyes, and while she may not win any beauty pageants, she had a charm that would make people stop and take a second look, a Jane Se Qua that was simply magical. Walking out of the bathroom, she was wet and garden fresh. Water drops still clung to her, as if not willing to leave her lisome skin, and yet sliding down helplessly. Her dark hair was in ringlets, with a water drop at the tip of each strand dangling like a tiny electric bulb, reflecting the morning light coming in through the slits in the curtain. She could be the dream of any man, the darling of any parent, and the adored member of any family. And yet, she was all alone in this whole wide world, living in an apartment all by herself. Inside that slim body was a soul that was delicate, yet strong, forged by an impossibly difficult life, bearing a burden beyond anyone's wildest imagination. For, in her heart, she carried a secret she hoped she would never have to reveal. Outwardly, however, she took this enormous hardship lightly. No one could tell that she had this living trauma as her constant companion, which never left her while awake or asleep. For any outsider, she was this sweet, smart girl who was always well behaved, had a decent job that she excelled at, and continued living her life happily with no apparent sorrow. She had worked very hard to ensure that this impression stayed. For most part, she just minded her own business. She stayed on the 10th floor of Kenwood Apartments, an upmarket residence, in a very well-furnished four-bedroom apartment. It was far beyond her needs, and seemed outside her means as a customer service executive. She knew neither her neighbors nor anyone else in the housing society. She went to work in the mornings, returned in the evenings, and stayed indoors on her days off. She listened to the radio, watched television, read books. That was her world, a world she built carefully, a world that was strictly out of bounds for others. Now, fresh as morning dew, she walked to her wardrobe in the bedroom. The radio was now playing another song, and this found an echo on her lips, too. She tossed her bathrobe onto her queen-sized bed, her careless aim knocking her pillow askew, revealing a knife hidden underneath. The sight of that knife brought back many memories, all of them bad, but it saved her life more than once, sheathed in the scabbard of her pillow, and so there it would remain. She moved over to replace the pillow, and caught a quick look at its gorgeous artistry, Kali's tongue and teeth prominent against her ebony skin. Pollock danced back toward her wardrobe and slipped on a black top and black knee-length skirt within minutes. Still humming the song, she did her hair using two combs, a wide tooth comb followed by a narrow tooth one. After tying her hair neatly with a tiny clip, she stepped out of the bedroom. She went to the kitchen and made her breakfast, frying an egg sunny side up and making a toasted tomato and cheese sandwich while humming along with the radio. Breakfast ready, she took orange juice from the fridge and poured it into a glass. She carried it to the dining table, sat down and had a leisurely breakfast. No hurry, no panic. Pollock was always this way, ever since her childhood in Haridwar, through her days of utter poverty. Even back then when she did not have much, she was highly disciplined in terms of her punctuality, her commitment to what she was doing, and her sense of responsibility. She had completely mastered her mind. In every little thing she did, that discipline was evident. After breakfast, she would clean the plate and glass at once, then turn them upside down to dry, leaving the kitchen exactly as it was from the outset. The same went for her clothes. Soiled clothes always found their way into a laundry bin which she emptied every week on her off day, and washed them. The same day, she would neatly press her office dresses then stack or hang them in their wardrobe. Pollock did not employ any domestic help unlike every other household in her apartment building. Most of her neighbors employed two or more maids, and many had drivers and cooks, too. For a couple of weeks after she moved in, 
she was pestered by maids who desperately wanted to work with her, she had a hard time convincing them that she did not want or need any help, choosing to do all her own chores, Pollock ultimately told security not to let any job seekers to her door, explaining that besides the fact that she could do all the work herself, she couldn't keep an eye on them to make sure they weren't stealing from her, that made complete sense to the security desk, her weekly groceries from the shop inside the Kenwood apartment complex were delivered at her tower's security desk every Saturday, she would pick them up and pay while returning from work, she truly had no need for anyone to come inside her home on a regular basis, and she aimed to keep it that way, the apartment she had was very much a refuge, while the office was her special place she could be safe from her thoughts, her home was her sanctuary away from the world, the only place where she could be herself, to allow anyone else inside her home would be a complete violation of everything she wanted to protect, Pollock's parents had died about three years ago when they could not bear a shock, she was to blame and she could never forgive her for it, she now had her brother Nyan as the only one she could call family, although Pollock did have a sister, a twin sister, named Kala but she had never seen her, Pollock had often heard her father talk about Kala and her uncle since she was six years old until they died three years ago, when Pollock and Kala were born, her parents, Ramnayin and Sumitra Devi, could barely afford to raise one child, let alone two, while many parents might consider having twins to be a miracle, a gift from God, for Pollock's family, it was a burden, Ramnayin's brother Sitaram worked on a sugarcane plantation in Muzaffarnagar, which gave him moderately more income than Ramnayin, but more importantly, it was consistent, he and his wife were unable to have a child of their own, a child they wanted so dearly, a couple married for many years without a child faced social stigma in India, it was ironic for a country of over 1, 25 billion people, Ramnayin felt that this was a sign from the gods to save his infant daughter from a life of abject poverty, Ramnayin thought he would be able to see Kala growing, but almost as soon as Ramnayin gave Kala to his brother, he stopped meeting Ramnayin or any other family members, Ramnayin learnt that Sitaram did not want Kala to know that he was not her father, he took her away, and Ramnayin never saw Kala again, a couple of years later, Sumitra Devi gave birth to a baby boy, they named him Nayan, both of the parents were out of the house often, scrounging together a meager existence for themselves in any way they could, they were quite familiar with the taste of hardship, enough to understand how fortunate they were to even have a roof over their heads, that room may have only had one room to shelter, one bed for comfort, but it was more than many of their neighbors, and for that they were truly thankful, throughout her childhood until she moved to Dehradun, Pollock did a lot of the housework while their parents were out, and cared for her infant brother like her own son, even though she was far too young to have such responsibility, during the school years, Pollock would give her pencils and paper to Nyan to use rather than keep them for herself, she knew that he would be the savior of their family, much of the money she earned in childhood and later, went into his education, she constantly inspired him to reach ever higher, doing everything she could to make him into the man he eventually became, about four years ago, Nyan got a job in New York City with one of the biggest financial conglomerates in the world, and every day he thanked Pollock for that, it was she, more than anyone else, even his parents, who supported him through the darkest years of their life, and now that he had a great career, influence, and connections, he would do anything within his power to protect his sweet sister Pollock, Pollock had always loved Nyan like a mother, just as Pollock was finishing her breakfast after getting ready for office, her phone started vibrating, it was a call from her only friend in the world Jane, Pollock always kept her phone in her handbag whenever she stepped out, and never took it out until she was back, she would then keep the phone in front of her, but she did not expect any calls or messages, and rarely got them, the only call Pollock ever made was to the grocery store in her apartment's lobby, she never called her office nor Jane, even if there was a missed call, there were only four phone numbers stored in Pollock's phone, Jane, Rita, driver Ram and her brother Nyan, any call or message unless it was from one of these four numbers from her address book, was automatically blocked, it saved Pollock from receiving calls and messages from those selling insurance, offering cheap loans or selling other stuff, Jane knew Pollock's schedule, and only called during the time she knew her to be home, Pollock normally received one or two calls a month from her brother, and one call every few months from Jane, Jane used to call her more often, but in the last year the frequency had diminished, in fact, it had been almost four months since they had last spoken. The phone started dancing, its top portion moving in a circle upon the table, the display lit brightly, 
Jane calling, Pollock really hadn't missed their conversations, but she did wonder why Jane hadn't bothered to call her for so long. Pollock assumed it was the same reason she had always figured for two years, Jane was too busy as the mother of a growing baby. Fortunately, the actual reason for Jane's calls had always been different, although they came less often. However, she imagined Jane had something special to tell her today. The thought of a mother and baby stirred a flood of emotions within Pollock. She thought of her own mother and herself. Pollock would never see her mother again, nor ever become a mother herself. Her thoughts turned to the only man she had ever loved, and how tragically it all ended. It was such a short period, but enough to last a lifetime. It was not the first time she had these morbid thoughts. They kept her awake at night. Yes, poor little Pollock. How terrible life could be for a girl who had to live alone and would never see another human being for the rest of her life, despite possessing perfect eyesight. The thought of having a child was even more cumbersome. She knew of no other way to move forward except the way she had already devised, which required this grand scheme of faking a handicap. To think of a man and her own child, would require throwing everything away, and that was not something she could afford to do. It would mean destroying her career, a career she had managed to excel at despite her condition. It was a job she loved, for a company that loved her in return. The office was a perfect place for her, a place where she could really truly forget about everything that had happened to her in the past, and all the terrible things that could happen to her in future. It was true freedom for eight hours a day, six days a week. Her office was a shovel that she could use to dig herself out of her misery and self-pity, burying herself in work instead. At her desk, she was too busy to think about all of the love she was not permitted to enjoy. Her telephone transactions drowned out the noises of her colleagues' stories about family vacations, weddings, and birthday parties. Her cubicle was a sanctuary that protected her from the rest of the world, a world that was always stretching its green tendrils around her ankles, trying to pull her into the light. She had committed to being a denizen of darkness, and she would do everything she could to remain in its shadow forever. It was another reason she was so good at her job. Surrounding herself with work meant that she had literally nothing else to focus on. As soon as she began to have some breathing room, she would necessarily make more work for herself, staying so busy that she would never be able to consider her life without it. Her colleagues simply thought she was an overachiever, some kind of apple polisher that always got high marks in school and now brought that same kind of arrogant discipline to her workplace. The truth was far from that. Pollock did not realize that the phone had stopped dancing before it could complete its first full circle. She stared at the half-eaten sandwich, its brown slice of bread had shifted slightly, revealing a half-eaten piece of tomato and cheese underneath. Pollock focused on the large holes in the bread, the red of the tomato shined through the largest one, red as a rose. Pollock's eyesight was quite keen, indeed. The peaking tomato served as a focal point for Pollock's unintentional meditative trance, sending her down a deep, dark tunnel of thought. The phone resumed its dance. Jane was calling again. Pollock knew that Jane would not call a third time today if she did not take the call now. Pollock waited for the phone to complete its full circle dance, then picked it up as if to reward it with some intimacy. Hello, Jane, how are you doing? Asked Pollock. Her voice was guarded, ashamed to reveal her feelings around not having spoken in so long. Hi, Pollock. I am, a, okay, Jane said, obviously concealing the truth. Pollock picked up the quiver in Jane's voice. What has happened? Are you really okay? Pollock asked. Not really, she replied, her voice dripping with sadness. I'm sorry, please tell me what's wrong. Pollock asked again with concern, wondering if her fears were coming true. No, this isn't about me. You answer my questions first, then I will tell you about myself, okay? Said Jane. Okay. Pollock replied, wondering what Jane meant. How are you doing? getting by, it's all the same here, thank god, there were sadness and smiles mixed in Pollock's tone, how is the office? Jane asked, same, oh, but I got a new cab driver about three months ago, Pollock replied, oh, really? How is he? He's quite good, thank god, the company makes sure I get polite and patient drivers, just as I need them to be, Pollock then added, thank you for getting me a job here, enough of that, Pollock, please, don't ever mention it, Jane said in loving rebuke. I didn't do you any favors, you worked for the company before. Regardless of however true that was, Pollock nevertheless felt deeply obliged to Jane for her efforts. Indeed, whenever the topic of Pollock's work came up in conversation, she could not help but thank her. 
It was true that Palak had previously worked with Vodatel, one of the largest telecom service providers in India and the world. She used to work in customer service in their Dehradun branch about three years prior, where Jane was both her boss and her friend. After a couple years, Palak needed a job in the national capital region. Jane had moved to Delhi about 18 months earlier to work in Vodatel's Delhi office, quitting later to focus on her pregnancy and future motherhood. Her husband insisted that she quit the job instead of taking the generous maternity leave that Vodatel provided. Jane verified Pollock's credentials for Vodatel Delhi, that her job in Vodatel, Delhi would be her first, and that she came to Delhi from Haridwar instead of from Dehradun. Jane had done an immense favor to Pollock by jeopardizing her own credibility with Vodatel, compromising her future chances of working with Vodatel or any other multinational companies by verifying Pollock's false credentials. Jane had gone a step further. She concealed the fact that Pollock was now employed in her previous company Vodatel in their own city, even from her husband. Jane's husband Paul was not the only one from whom Jane kept Pollock's secret. Jane told no one, including her Dehradun Vodatel friends. Jane had sworn on her unborn child to keep Pollock's secrets forever. From time to time their old Dehradun Vodatel friends would call, and despite Jane's best efforts they would eventually bring up Pollock and ask if she knew where Pollock might be, knowing full well that she and Jane were best friends. For a time, the two were inseparable, Jane even sharing her apartment with Pollock for free. Jane would feign ignorance about Pollock's current whereabouts and status. For anyone who pressed the issue, Jane would make sure not to pick up calls from them in the future. Jane applied such methods to deal with her Dehradun Vodatel friends out of necessity. While it caused her friend list to grow ever smaller, Jane did not care. She was prepared to do much more for Pollock. Despite this, the two never promised or attempted to see each other, even though they were living only 30 kilometers apart. Pollock tried her best to turn the conversation away from herself. Okay, now, how are you Jane? Pollock asked. I am okay, Pollock. How about yourself, everything the same? Jane answered and asked Pollock in the same breath. It was strange how badly Jane wanted to hear if everything remained status quo. That was the best Pollock could hope for. Almost anything new was likely to be bad for Pollock. Yes, Jane, everything is the same, thankfully. How is little Chiku doing? Has he started talking yet? He must be around 18 months now, right? Talking about Jane's son, Pollock's eyes brightened and a smile formed on her face. The only other time Pollock smiled like that was when she would speak with her customers, when making a large sale or solving a complex issue for one of Vodatel's large corporate customers. Yes, he just turned 18 months, Jane said. You know girls are so much more advanced than boys at this age. He only just learned to say mama and papa. At least he is talking now, Jane laughed. Pollock managed a small laugh as well, feeling her own maternal love for the baby. She wanted to see Chiku more than she wanted to see Jane, but she dared not say it, reminding herself that in her life, nothing new could be good. What else is going on? Pollock asked, it's been a long time since we've talked. Yeah, Jane sighed, seemingly hiding the answer to Pollock's question, and inadvertently hinting at the unpleasant reason for not calling Pollock sooner. Deep down, Pollock knew, but she had to make sure, is there any particular reason? Pollock asked, no. I have been busy with Chiku, Jane reconsidered telling Pollock why she chose to call today, but then decided it was better to just come out with it, and yes, there is another reason I called you, Jane quickly added, cold chills ran through Pollock's skin, what? Pollock asked, scared, she was easily scared, knowing as she did that no information could ever be good news for her, it's Paul, Jane started, Pollock was startled, as the two usually avoided discussing her husband, what happened? Pollock asked, meekly. Jane swallowed, then spoke. You know that he suspects I am hiding information about you from him? Hmm. Pollock let out a disappointed affirmative sound. She didn't like the sound of that. Ever since we moved back to New Delhi, he blames you every time I am angry with him or we fight over something. All couples fight, and I blame him for things he says or does, or doesn't do, but he always blames you. He keeps bringing up the secret we are keeping from him. It's ridiculous, he doesn't even know Jane. Jane. Interjected Pollock, Jane's emotional flow was broken, yes. Jane was surprised that Pollock had cut her short, it was quite unlike her. Pollock could hear another call waiting and rightly guessed that it would be her cab driver, Ram, calling to come to pick her up, 
It couldn't have come at better time. I am running a little late today. My new cab driver is calling. Can we talk tomorrow? I'm starting a night shift tomorrow, so I'll have the whole day until late evening. Unless it can't wait. I would love to have a long chat with you tomorrow. Is that okay? The clock on her wall read a quarter past nine. It certainly was too late. Pollock had a strict arrangement with her cab drivers that she would meet them at nine o'clock, sharp. However, knowing that life is full of twists and turns, and being a pragmatic sort, Pollock built in a buffer zone. In the incredibly rare occasion that she wasn't ready at nine, she would still have a few minutes to meet the cabbie. But if things were running far behind schedule, there may be a problem. After 15 minutes, the cab driver was instructed to call her mobile. If that didn't move the process along, then Pollock obviously had bigger problems to worry about than being at her job. In this case, the only problem she had was a talkative friend. She would have to end this conversation quickly. Jane reconsidered if what she needed to say could wait until tomorrow, and decided it could. She too wanted to have a long chat with Pollock. Jane could also see her baby, who had been fast asleep since his last feeding and diaper change, had started kicking the air with his legs. His face was upset, as if preparing to cry, like having a bad dream. She thought he might also be hungry, wet, or both. Jane knew from the expressions on his sweet face that he would start screaming for her any moment. Yeah, that's fine. We will talk tomorrow. I will call you around 11 o'clock. You're right. It will be good to have a long chat after a while. Jane replied as she walked towards her baby. He had finally started his ritual with a few short bursts of crying, as if turning over the starter in his car, preparing for his journey to Screamy Town. Okay then, talk to you tomorrow. Pollock immediately picked up Ram's call, waiting on the other line. She answered him with a quick, coming, bye ya, two minutes. Disconnecting before hearing if Ram had any reply, Pollock sighed, dreading the inevitable conversation with Jane. She knew exactly why Paul was so sour on Pollock, and why he never wanted them to see each other, or even talk on the phone. But the secret wasn't what Jane and Pollock were keeping from Paul, but rather the secret Pollock and Paul were keeping from Jane. It was a terrible thing that had happened, and in hindsight, Pollock wished she had told Jane long ago. At the time, she was ashamed, and did not want to jeopardize Jane's happiness. But as time wore on, as she matured as a person, the secret loomed like a dark cloud over every conversation she ever had with her. Deep inside, Pollock knew that was the real reason she avoided Jane's phone calls. Hearing that Jane was unhappy in her relationship with Paul made her regret the decision to keep that skeleton in her closet. If she had told her the truth long ago, she would have been hurt, certainly, but she wouldn't have any cause to suffer now. Yet she couldn't tell her now, either. To do so would risk losing everything they had together, regardless of how little it had become. For Jane to learn of the secret they had kept from her all these years was tantamount to utter betrayal. No, the secret would have to stay hidden. Pollock swallowed. Perhaps she wouldn't take Jane's call tomorrow, after all. Ram, meanwhile, steadfastly held onto the line, waiting for his call to connect. It was only the second time in three months that he had to call her. Pollock was usually in the cab by 9.15, and Ram was instructed not to call her unless she had not met him by then. But today, she was late, and as soon as he dialed her number, it went to call waiting. An automated female voice gave him the option to wait or to disconnect and call again later. Ram chose the first option. He began wondering who the madam could be talking to, making all sorts of silly fantasies in his head, but after some time his attention was diverted back to the automated voice, repeating the options. He liked the voice of the automated woman. She had a smiling, sweet, and sexy voice. Ever since he had joined Vodotel, Ram had hoped to see this lady in person, just to watch her talk. Sometimes, he would deliberately call wrong numbers or the Vodotel call center just to hear her voice. By now he had created a complete profile of this woman in his mind. He even had a name for her, Vodabai. In his mind, she was 32 years old, 5 foot 3, and dusky looking, wearing a sari with her navel showing. Being himself just a little older and a smidge taller, Vodabai seemed to be the perfect match for him. Coming, Baya, two minutes. Pollock said, rudely interrupting his Vodabai. Okay, madam, Ram replied, simultaneously awkwardly and abruptly. He couldn't help but feel a little ashamed, as if Pollock had caught him doing something bad. End of chapter 3